It started back in the 1800s, the mid-1800s, when they uh, developed sprinkler systems. And you've probably, you've, you have all seen sprinkler systems in commercial buildings. When you have sufficient heat, it activates the sprinkler, the water sprays out, puts the fire out. In about 1935, there was a Swiss scientist by the name of Walter Jaeger who was developing a system to detect poisonous gas. And he used a radioactive source that re uh, gave off radioactive ions, and these would react with the poisonous gas and, in theory, set off his alarm. Whilst he was trying to develop it, so the story goes, he was having a smoke, he blew some smoke into the device, it tripped it, and voila, we've got ourselves a smoke detector. Now, 15 or 16 years later, in 1951, the first patent was lodged for a photoelectric smoke alarm. We've got a photoelectric alarm here, and how these worked was a simple process you have a light source shining on a photoelectric cell and um, when smoke broke through the light source, it would actually trip the alarm. It's very similar to when you walk into a shop and you set off an alarm and often what's happening is you're just breaking the beam of light, same principle. But you actually had to have smoke to trip it off, which is why photoelectrics hardly have any false alarms. Now that was in 1951. Now when the mid-60s came along, the ionization detector, which as we know was originally developed to detect poisonous gases, this was now starting to come onto the market. Now bear in mind at this stage in the mid-60s we had heat-activated sprinklers and smoke-activated photoelectric alarms. So what the manufacturers did so they could sell this new magical ionization detector, they produced a number of um, articles, of, sorry, at advertisements, they were full page advertisements that they put in fire journals and I'm going to read some of the wording from some of these ads. Firstly we've got one here which says our device will sense products of combustion and instantly respond. Another one, only our fire detection system senses the invisible odorless products of combustion that come before a fire breaks out in flame and smoke. And here's another one. Only our alarm reacts immediately to the invisible products of combustion, and they've highlighted the word before, before there is visible smoke, heat, or flame. Now, if you work for a company that is selling heat alarms or photoelectric smoke alarms, how can you compete with the device that's going to go off before you've got any heat or smoke? So most of the manufacturers back in the mid-60s, they were marketing these devices as the device that would go off before heat or smoke. It was very hard for the photoelectric and the um, marketers of heat alarms to compete with them. And what they did, what the manufacturers did, some of them did, they went to fire brigades, they would um, get a waste paper bin, and they'd get the fire chief and the firefighters around, and they'd say, look, we're going to show you this great new device They'd set fire to carbon paper in the rubbish bin and that would almost instantly trip the ionisation alarm. And everyone was just amazed, wow, that's fantastic. And they actually managed to recruit the firefighters um, to actually sell and promote these smoke alarms. Now, that was all very wonderful, but how do you sell a smoke alarm? You've got to get it certified. And the institution that would certify smoke alarms in America is called Underwriters Laboratories. Now, in Australia and New Zealand, we have the standards organisation, we have the Australian and New Zealand standards. And for devices to be able to be sold in our country, they must pass these standards. In America, they have underwriters laboratories and they create fire codes. Now, what happened is underwriters laboratories had created a fire code in the 60s so that smoke detectors could pass. And that was called UL217. Now, I have a document here which is about UL's 217 code. This is actually a, from a trial. These are the trial notes from a court case where uh, a child died in a, in a house fire which was protected by an ionisation smoke alarm. The child died and his brother was severely burnt. Anyway, it says here, the plaintiff's expert, these are the people who are suing, their experts, however, testified in detail about the ineffectiveness of the UL 217 standard to test ionisation detectors. 
Okay, so for years the industry has known that UL7's 217 standard is actually a, a complete farce. So what happened is we had a test that was farcical for testing these smoke alarms and what happened, the smoke alarms were passing the test and were being sold to the consumers. Now this went on for over 10 years, so by 1970, the mid-70s, thousands of people had died in house fires protected by these ionisation devices. And at this stage, the government thought, gee, we'd better do some testing because there'd been no formal government testing of smoke detectors. So what happened in 1974, the US government funded the dunes test. Now these were done in the Indiana Dunes Wildlife Preserve, and it took two years to do the tests, and here's the, here's the actual tests that were carried out. And after two years, if we read the conclusion of the test, that actually says a residential smoke detector of either the ionization or photoelectric type set at the sensitivity levels encountered during this study would provide adequate life-saving potential under most residential fire conditions when properly installed. Now, most people who looked at these tests went straight to the conclusions and just accepted that the conclusions would be correct because surely no one would ever falsify test results. But the interesting thing is even though these were government funded tests, there were four signatories to this test and three of those four signatories worked or were part of Underwriters Laboratories, the company or the organisation who had been certifying these alarms as being okay. Now when it was found that in the test the um, actual amount of time to detect a slow smouldering fire was over an hour, the, test, the people doing the test were horrified and they had a choice. They could either come clean and say, well, we've actually really screwed up. These ionisation alarms are defective. We should ban them uh, because they don't detect slow smouldering fires. Or they could cover up the tests. And as hard as it is to, to comprehend, they did the latter. They covered the tests up because that conclusion was false. Now... That was in 1976 that the tests were finalised and they were reported. Now at this time there was a, a gentleman by the name of Richard Patton who is a registered fire protection engineer. He's one of the world's leading authorities on smoke alarms and he smelled a rat. And he did an analysis of the Indiana Dunes test, this is it here, and he discovered that these tests were falsified and we have this analysis on our website at joinourcrusade.com forward slash docs. And when he did this analysis, that showed that these things were falsified. He also sent out 3,000 copies of this report, the Smoke Detector Fraud Report. He sent out 3,000 copies to fire engineers and fire chiefs right throughout America. But bear in mind, at this stage, these guys had been recommending this device for over 10 years. And it was really hard for someone to believe it because, as you know yourself, you burn the toast, your smoke alarms go off, and then someone tells you that they're not effective. It doesn't make sense. So this basically fell on deaf ears. However, this, he sent this out in 1976. For, uh, sorry, the next year, 1977, the Business Weekly magazine published this article, and it was called The Fiery Debate Over Smoke Alarm Efficiency. And what was really interesting in this article, Don Steele, who was regarded as the father of smoke alarms, he said in here that he and his mates went into a room, they, no matter what type, sort of fire was burning, when the smoke level got to 4%, everyone was heading for the door. So they found out back then in 1977 that the human, can, the human body cannot handle more than 4% smoke in a room. Now, given that, what was happening in the industry, they were trying to get underwriters laboratories to keep the level of smoke to part that smoke detectors could pass in their tests to a maximum of 4%. And they said the most it should be was 7, but they were really arguing for 4. So that's what was trying to happen. They said, don't, you know, if a smoke alarm doesn't go off at less than 7%, don't pass it, let the thing fail. Okay, that was in 1977. 